the chance to talk to you all today. It uh, sounds like a really great group here. It sounds like you're having a lot of fun. So, um, it is true that I grew up in Oakland Park, and we, my, I, when I got married, we moved to Western Kansas, and I've been there over 30 years. So, basically, I'm in, in Manhattan during the week and home on the weekends. So, I'm just really glad to be here with you today and talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, which is fire ecology. Can someone just pick the Fire ecology is, is fascinating because it's so complex. And just when you think you've got it figured out, there's some other thing that you learn about or you find out about it, and it's even more complex than you thought. So today I'm going to try and, and present from the, the point of view of what would be useful for you when you talk to other people about fire colonies, because you're all educators here and you need the information in order to share it with the others. So when I look at this picture here and I start to identify what's going on here, I can tell a few things already. One is this is a very low intensity fire. And you can tell that because of the flame size and also because you wouldn't have the camera down in the grass if this were a high intensity flame. And you can also tell that it's not very hot by the embers. There, there, there's a few embers, but they're not a lot. There is material, plant material being left, which is also very common. And so you can tell quite a bit about a fire just by looking at it. One of the questions that I get a lot um, is, well, can't we get the same effects of fire with some other way? Uh, do we have to burn? And the answer is yes. Fire does a tremendous number of things to the ecosystem. Uh, we can get rid of the trees mechanically or, chem or chemically. We can um, mow and get rid of some of the vegetation, mow or graze. But the thermal effects, the effects of the heat and the burning on the, the vegetation, there is nothing that replaces that. And so when you talk to people and they're, they're terrified about fire and, and they want desperately for you to say, yes, there is something else that we can do instead of burn. But the answer is no, there isn't anything else that we can do that will give the same effects as burning. So some of those effects are we can control weeds and, and shrubs. Um, and trees. We can get rid of litter. This is just a typical Flint Hills pasture. This is in Pottawatomie County and there's a lot of duff there. This is a, getting ready to burn and mow the, the fire line there. And that, that layer of duff is extremely detrimental to the grasses. It will change the composition from the warm season grasses to cool season grasses. It will encourage um, uh, other forbs. It will allow seedling cedars and other brush to get started. So getting rid of that is really important. And as you can imagine, there's no good way that's even remotely economical to get rid of that much litter uh, besides burning. Burning rejuvenates the plant. You can see here there's kind of a ring with a burnout center. A lot of our grasses are bunch grasses. And when they burn, the, the, the part in the center is already kind of got old and dead. And so it will burn out and then you get all these little plants along, all these little um, uh, shoots along the edges and they will start developing into to different plants. And so this is one way you get this nice thick grass stained is by burning. Um, we have beautiful wildflowers. A lot of uh, forbs respond to fire. It opens up the stand and gives them light. But as I mentioned before, there's a lot of species composition changing going on that fire is responsible for. And it, to maintain the diversity of the prairie, we need fire. Then there is the, the wildlife habitat. There are a number of species that are grassland obligate. They only do well in open grasslands. And with 97 or so percent of the tall grass prairie that once existed in North America gone, <coughs> what's left, it's really important to maintain that with fire, which is its natural component and um, to, to provide the correct habitat for these species that, that are obligate on grasslands. Fire can also be used for grazing distribution. Um, not only wildlife, but livestock respond to fire. Contrary to popular belief, cattle do not just mow off what's out there. They are selected grazers, as, as are bison and, and deer and everything else. They, they don't just take whatever's in front of them. Um, think of it as being in front of a full buffet. You don't take equal quantities of everything that's out there. 
you like this better and this better, and you, you pick. And the, the livestock rats are doing the same thing. And one thing they like is freshly burned vegetation. Okay, and as you might expect, uh, the time of burn has something to do with this also. When you compare unburned to burned, you can see there's a over 30 pound advantage that is all done in 90 days, the first 90 days of the growth grazing season. From a livestock producer standpoint, that's tremendous. That's the difference between profit and loss. And that's one reason that we have so many people at their own expense burning the Flint Hills, because the cost of the livestock gain is that the, the income from the livestock gain is greater than the cost of the burning. Also, well, we'll get to that later. Okay. So one of the things we need to think about is are fire effects the same every year? And the answer is no. Uh, a single fire could have a lot of different effects, and, and, but it's the long-term repeated pattern of fire that will have the effects. So the, all these things can change from year to year, but the overall thermal effects are going to be about the same. So over the long term, you're going to have a response to fire. But for any individual fire, all these things are going to change the fire ecology. Um, most of these I will talk about later, so I'm not going to get into them a lot right now. Um, but, but everything is going to affect the fire, even things what direction the fire comes from. So when I was driving in here today, uh, along the road here at Kanza, and I saw that hillside that's burned. So when you go out today, try and think how fire burned that hillside. Was it started at the bottom and burned up? Was it at the top and came down? Was it a head fire? Was it a back fire? And some things to think about is that fire intensity always goes up uphill. So look at the side of the, what's left, the vegetation is unburned. Is it the side, um, uh, which side burned and which side didn't burn? All those things are a result of the fire and how it moves through there. We're going to start with the soil here, and um, you don't generally think of the soil as being really important in fire. It's like, like so many other things in the prairie. Uh, what's really important and happening is under the ground. So I just love this picture, and you can see that there's a root system in here, okay? And this is a pine seedling, and all of this cloud that looks like fine roots is actually uh, mycorrhiza. It's actually a fungal association with the plant. So you can see that for any plant, you see these, these root systems and say, oh, these prairie plants, they have these beautiful root systems, they're so deep and everything. But that is a fraction of what they're actually using in the soil. The soil is matted together with a whole bunch of different microorganisms that extend that plant's reach into the soil to extract nutrients. Um, and water and whatever else they need it's an extremely competitive society out there. That's one of the things about rangelands is it's a war out there. It's a war for the things that you need to grow. And your allies are these, these associations you have with these microorganism plants. So in the organic matter, you've got some that's, that's decomposing. You've got some that's just there. Less than 5% is living organisms but that 5% is absolutely critical to the health of the prairie. Um, <clears throat> these organisms, they work together. There's a whole bunch of these in here. And they are what makes the soil aggregates. And everyone knows that prairie soil is rich. And what is making it rich is this: these microorganisms have glued the soil together. And I found out this year, really fascinating, that as they glue it together with the, their strands and their hyphae and everything, they can actually store carbon inside the clod. So the soil, pieces of soil can often have carbon stored inside them and be bound together in sort of a solid clod. And that is, is one of the reasons that grasslands are huge carbon sinks. They take, you, people say, oh, well, of course, we're storing all this carbon. We're storing a tremendous amount of carbon in prairies. And we're storing it even a more permanent form because we're storing it in the soil. We're storing it in the microorganisms, in the roots, in these, uh, and in these clods of dirt. And you know when you take pull apart prairie soil, it's all cloddy, right? It's, it's, it comes off in little nodule type things. 
If you go to agricultural soil, um, there will be claws, but they will not have the structure. If you squeeze them in your fingers, they'll, they'll just smash. And that's because they don't have this, this micro, these, these uh, microorganisms holding it together. Then there's what I call the ecological dance. And this is because in ecology, if you do one thing, it has repercussions in different directions. And sometimes they're directly off, they appear to be directly offsetting. So I was reading this paper, getting ready for, the, for giving this talk, and I came across um, this one paper that just illustrated this so, so greatly. In prairie, there are two things that are considered um, essential. One is grazing and the other is fire. So in some cases, those are considered disturbances, but the growing consensus in the Great Plains is that withholding those two things are a greater disturbance, um, are the true disturbance, because those things are essential for the prairies to develop. So we see here that, that burning, 25% increase in grow, root growth, but guess what? Grazing decreased it. So it limit, um, fires increased in limitation, but grazing decreased it. So you've got these two things working back and forth together through all these different um, areas. This is the mineral cycling in the soil, but you could say it for other things too. So um, when we talk about what's going on out here, be aware that it's not just a plus, plus, plus. It's more of a, 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 a round balance where everything is just trying to work together. Um, to, to, it, it's very difficult to give a mathematical formula to this, what's going on because of this. It's nonlinear. Okay, so how does this all relate to fire? Well, it relates because um, fire, not surprisingly, takes all the vegetation off the soil, or most of it, and um, it heats the soil. So I had someone from EPA call me and say, you know, I, I heard that fire heats the soil. And it's like, that's just ridiculous. I mean, it's only there for a few seconds and then it's gone. Well, <coughs> that's true. It's not the fire itself that heats the soil. It is exposing the soil. It's got the ash, it's black, and the solar radiation. Okay, so that's what's heating the soil, not the fire itself. And why is this important? Well, here's seasonal and microbial activity. So we just talked about the microbes. And there's the last frost, and look how that stuff just takes off. So it's out there working. It's pumping uh, nutrients through the system. It's, it's going, and it's, the time of that is made earlier by fire. Because fire blackens the surface, the surface gains the solar radiation, and <coughs> microbes get to work. So your pastures are going to green up sooner than if you had litter. Oops. Excuse me. Okay, so now you've got it. You've got the, the microbes growing, you've got the soil cleared off, and your plants are going to get started. So this is what tall grass prairie can look like in the late winter. And this is what it looks like after it's burned. These plants are going to have a lot easier time getting light to grow than something that's growing down in here. These things will grow. They, they will come up. They're going to be more sparse. <coughs> Excuse me. But they're not going to have the access to light and the rapid growth that they're going to get here now that they've burned. So fire is making these plants green up earlier and grow also and grow faster because they have more light. Oops. So we'll talk a little bit of light here. So PAR is photosynthetic um, active radiation, and it's the, the part of the light spectrum that plants use to grow. And this is from a study done here on Kanza. And you can see how much more light a burned plant, uh, a, a plant is getting in an area that's burned than in an area that's not burned. Um, so you're losing 58% of uh, your light if you don't burn. That plant's getting 58% less light. And that relates to above ground projection. So here we've got, um, and this is in June, so this is at the height of the growing season. Your burn has got um, 61 0.1 as compared to 29.5, so you have a 55% decrease in production 
if you do not burn on tolerance uh, in life. So, okay. We'll go on to how this relates to plants to each other. So, again, as I told you, there's a com competition out there, and everything that happens out there is going to affect those plants one way or another. So, if you have, um, these are called spring burns, and I want to talk about that in a minute. When, these, when the burning resource was first started here at K-State, back in the, the, uh, the, the, the recent research was started back in the 60s. And <coughs> at the time, a lot of producers were burning really early, because it's one of the things you know you want to get it out of the way and get on with having your cows or getting your steers in there. So early means like the end of February. Mid means like the beginning of March and April. And late means later on in April. So those are the terms. Um, if late in a phenological state means the, the big blue stem is about two inches tall. So that's considered the time, the best time to burn. So here we go. You can see that um, these are the perennials. I didn't get the labels on here. Uh, biennials and the annuals. You can see that the perennial forbs actually like burning early. And what, what does that tell you? Well, one of the things is when there's, you'll hear somebody say, well, that was a wildlife burn. And that really means it's a late winter, very early spring burn. And the reason is because wildlife people like forbs, which is, uh, and that's when you're going to get them. They're going to increase with that early burn. And they, um, your biennials and your annuals don't matter so much. But those perennial forbs that everyone likes to see out there, they're going to do better with an early season burn. So conversely, when you burn late, what benefits? So if, if, if forbs benefit if you burn early, then if you burn later in the spring, what's going to benefit? And those are our big four. We've got them here. The big blue stem, the switchgrass, uh, Indian grass, and little blue stem. So those big four like the late burn. And of the four, big blue stem loves fire. It doesn't matter when you burn. It doesn't matter how many times you burn. Big blue stem says, yes, bring it on. Okay, it loves fire. And you can see that from unburn to late spring burn, there's uh, uh, two, two degrees of uh, di significance difference between that. So of all the species, big blue stem is the one that likes fire the best. And from a livestock standpoint, that's wonderful because blue, big blue stem is considered one of the ice cream species. It's one of the species that livestock really love, and they really gain a lot of weight on it. So that's another reason for burning. But it doesn't matter in any case because wildlife like it too. If you want big blue stem, just increase the number of times you burn. But in all of these, your highest... Um, your highest basal cover, or the, the extent that the, of that plant covering the ground is highest in, in the late spring. So is that 2.52% of the coverage is blue, the blue stem that you have um, That's basal cover. When you do like cover by species, like percent, mm -hmm. it'll be way higher. It'll be like 40 or 50% in healthy tall grass. 40 to 50% of the plants out there will be big blue stem. In fact, the two, two blue stems together, big and, and little, often account for 60% of what's out there, if you burn a lot. So what's that a measure of again? What's that number referred to? The basal cover. So that is, um, okay, when you go out there and you look at the ground and you kind of pull the litter away, you'll see that there's plants and then there's areas that don't have plants that are bare, right? Mm -hmm. Well, of the areas that are covered correctly by plants, that won't be very high. That'll be maybe 15 20 percent. Okay. Of that, um, the, make sure I say this right, of that 15 percent, at least 2.5, 2 percent, it was covered by one species. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, actually, that's wrong. 2.52 percent of the entire amount, including the bare soil, is covered by big blue stem, okay? Because okay? there'll be a lot of bare soil out here too. But if only 15% of it has plants, then it's... It's a very, a very large, percent. it'll be like 50% of that, okay. okay? 
Okay. <clears throat> so I told you that that cattle are, are selected grazers, and people that know a lot about plants and, and livestock diets have gone out there and tried to pick a high quality diet. They know what plants cattle like, they know what the protein content of these plants are, and they'll pick it and then they'll match it to esophagated, uh, esophagealy fistulated steers, which are steers that have a, a cutout right here. So as they chew it and goes in their mouth, it drops into this bag. And then they collect that, analyze it, and that tells them what the animals are eating. And they do a dietary analysis on that. And invariably, the animals will end up picking a better diet than the scientists can. Um, there's actually a correction factor for that when you're, when you're doing diet studies. So they're, they're, gonna, they're just going to be better at it. So, <clears throat> a couple things I want to show you here is with Bernie, um, here's June, so here's the height of the season, and look at this, how, how high that goes um, on their protein before it tanks in late summer. And you can also see that if you don't burn, it tanks earlier, and you just simply never have the, the high protein in there for the diet. This is why the gains are phenomenal on the tall grass prairie in the spring and early summer is because of this high protein content. And um, you'll also know that by August, there's not really any difference between burned and unburned, and that is that just held out. And that's why the producers use the early intensive grazing, which is a grazing system where you put on twice the animals for half the time. It is the dominant system of grazing in the tall grass prairie where there's steers. Um, if this is a steer and heifer, a growing animal, it doesn't refer to cow cows. Okay, so you're putting your animals, so you're basically you're putting your teenagers' animals in front of an all-you-can-eat buffet of the highest quality food, and they gain two, two and a half pounds a day. Okay, and this is this is why after 180 days you take them off. So sometime in July you take them off because this quality is tanking. All right, you're not going to get those gains anymore. So you put them on twice the rate for half the time. So sometime here in July you get rid of your animals off and let the grass recover. But this is why, it's because the diet is going down so fast in quality. Okay, um, one of the other main reasons that we burn is for wildlife. And um, grassland birds, especially things like prairie chickens, have little chicks that run around on the ground. So here's your little chick that's about the size of a quarter, and that chick has got to go and <coughs> eat, find its living, which is basically insects. So first of all, if you were an insect, would you rather eat this or would you rather eat this? Okay, so your insects are going to be out here. Okay, this is probably taken earlier anyway, but this is much more open. You can see the dark ground in between there. It's obviously been burned. This little chick's going to come over in here. And not only can it find more insects there, but also it's much easier to get around. It can run in between these things. These, these forbs offer some cover so that the birds can't see it, the hawks can't come down and get the little chicks. So, um, but that's not all. You know, wildlife also needs shelter. So if it was the middle of the winter, this would look really good over here, right? You could nestle down in there, you know. If, if I were out there camping and I wanted some protection, this is where I would be, not in some bare spot. But I'd be out nestled down here in the grass. And a lot of animals use this residue and um, for roosting sites or for just bedding. But there's another, when we get to prairie chickens <coughs> and some other birds, there's actually a third thing you need besides shelter and food, and that's you need uh, a breeding ground. And prairie chickens are notorious for booming. They need big areas with very short vegetation where they can, the noise that they make will carry for a long distance. <coughs> so all of these things you have to take into account when you're, when you're doing fire because what you do is going to affect the other things. You don't want to have no nesting cover because this is obviously a better place to hide a nest than this, although this isn't bad. This is a lot better if I was trying to hide from predators. <clears throat> but there isn't going to be any food in here for my chicks, so I'd want to take them over here. So it's not only having the different kinds, but it's how they're juxtaposed on the landscape. How far apart, how far do I have to go from one to get to the other? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. 
Um, here is some grassland obligate species at this end. And these over here can take some, some, some taller vegetation. But you can see that there's some species that like this stuff that's grazed off to a nibbin. Um, and there's some that like it that's more or less ungrazed. And there's a whole range in between, and some people need, some, excuse me, some birds need more than one kind of habitat. So, <coughs> you can't see in the back, this is grazed clear off, and this is more or less ungrazed. So, when you're thinking about that, when you're thinking about fire and fire ecology, you've got to say, well, what am I managing for? It, is there a particular species I'm managing for? And given that um, usually you're managing for more than one. So if there's one of, of the range of, of wildlife that you're managing for, you manage for the one that has the most particular problems. So if I were going to manage for prairie chickens, that's a whole, they've got a specialized set that they need. But if I were going to manage for deer, it really doesn't matter. You know, as long as it's green and it's out there, I'm going to get deer. There's no point in really managing for deer because I'm going to get them anyway. So you pick the one that has the most uh, exacting requirements and you manage for that one. That's one, one strategy. Okay. <clears throat> one way that you can get the habitats to be in close proximity to other is called pyric herbivory <coughs> or patch burn grazing. And each year you burn a different chunk. And the animals will congregate on whatever's most recently burned, and they will graze it very, very close. That it'll be that that niven soft, that, that that high end, it'll be just bigger almost. Okay? But the next year you burn a different chunk, and the animals will move to that chunk, and the chunk that was you grazed so heavily the year before actually gets a rest because all the animals have moved to the other. And they, the time they spend on the freshly burned area um, is, is very high at the beginning of the season, obviously, because we saw that, that difference in the, the dietary content. And as the season goes on and the, the differences between the burned and the unburned become less, the animals will spread around more. But in, in the foothills, lots of times, by that time, the animals are gone anyway. So this is one way you can do it. This is an actual ranch, um, Jane Cover's ranch. This is how she is doing her patch burn grazing. And besides doing this by year, you can do this by season. So you can burn different times of the year. You can do both. You can burn different seasons at different, on different years, different patches. You can do whatever you want. But the mixing up is done largely for wildlife because it provides a lot of habitats, grassland habitats, in close juxtaposition for those animals that need a variety of habitats close together. OK. So one of the things that um, you can tell about fire and looking at the landscape is what kind of fire went through. So looking at this, um, I can tell you a few things that we can, we can talk about. Uh, both of these are large in extent. All right, these are big fires. You can see they go a long ways without anything changing. Um, I've got a lot of ash over here. See how white that is? That tells me that was a backfire. At this, this particular point in the fire, that was a backfire. Because the backfire is what leaves that really white ash. Will you go ahead and define backfire? Because there's some oh, people okay. who aren't going to know. Okay. The, uh, when, when a fire goes through, uh, if the wind is behind it and pushing it, that's a head fire. If you light a fire and the fuel is contiguous enough, the fire will back into the wind very slowly. Okay. The fuel it will just the fuel will kind of pull it through. And both parts of that are usually on a, on a given fire. You'll have both kinds. Usually the backfire is used to set the fire break, and then you turn around and come in from the other side with a head fire and burn into the fire break. So I'm guessing that this is probably a fire break. <clears throat> um, because it was moving slow and the debris was burning and falling, right? Because it was going into the wind. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fire was kind of being just pulled into the, the, the uh, fuel. Over here we see a lot of green. So that tells me that that was burned probably later in the year than this because we've got so much more green up. Or it could tell me that there's a lot of cool season grass in here, which didn't burn very well. Um, cool season grass are like forbs. They like the early burns and they hate, hate the late burns. So um, when the big blue stem is like this, the tall season grasses have already you know, put their carbohydrates into putting leaves and they're out growing. 
And so when you get those late summer burns, it sets them back. So if you don't want cool season grasses, which a lot of producers don't, <coughs> one of the ways you can change that species composition is to burn later. Cool season grasses in general are not as productive. And um, the warm season grasses for this far south in the United States are considered the normal. Um, the big ones here were Kentucky bluegrass, brome, and uh, fescue. So um, this is a more recent fire. I've still got smoke on the horizon. Um, I, might, I may have a little bit, it, because it's so patchy, I may have a little bit of nesting habitat in there mixed in, because it's not a complete bird, where this, there's not, not much to nest in. So part of what I'm trying to, to get across to you today is how to read the landscape. And we'll have a little exercise in this later. OK, fire effects are not just what happens um, when you burn. You can influence how they burn. So um, this is a fire in Oklahoma. And it's an intentional fire. And the, the goal is to get rid of these cedars. And in order to do that, you're going to have to have a really hot fire. You can't just start a fire like we do in the grass bank here and get it to go up into the cedars and jump from cedar to cedar like that. So to do that, you can burn at a time when cedars are particularly dry and susceptible, and you'll increase the cedar kill. Um, you can also increase the initial starting temperature of the fire. And one way you can do that is you can take <coughs> cedars and cut them and shove them under the edge of the cedars you want to burn. It's called cut and tuck. And when you light your fire and it runs into that cedars that are piled under the standing cedars, that immediately intensifies the fire and shoots it up into the canopy. Okay, so if you want to change the intensity of the fire, there are management tools that you can do to do that. You can burn when it's very hot. Um, it takes a few seconds at 140 degrees F to kill woody plant tissue. If you're starting at 90 or 100 degrees in the summer, it's a lot easier to get it up to that 40 than if you're starting at 50 in the spring. So summer burns are considered better at killing brush just because of that reason. You can increase the fuel load around trees that you want to get rid of, either like um, uh, you can put um, an extra, extra fuel in a, in a mod. A mod is like a clump of shrubs. You know, you've all seen those out on the landscape. There's like kind of a bunch that are around. That's, that's a mod. And if you throw like bales or something else in there, you can increase the fire intensity and increase your kill of those moths. So you, you can manipulate the, the ecology of, of what your fire is doing. Um, conversely, you can graze it all off and not have enough fire to carry a fire, or not, not enough fuel to carry a very big fire. So you can also do that too. If you want to decrease the in, uh, intensity, you can get rid of some of the fuel. <coughs> and typically that's done by grazing, by changing your grazing intensity. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of weather. This is a whole other talk in and of itself. But all of these things have a really big impact on your fire and the effect that it has. Uh, wind will affect how fast it burns and how completely it burns. A fire with a lot of wind is like pumping the bellows into a fireplace. You'll get a lot more intense fire and it will move fast and you'll do a lot of uh, um, burning. If you've got a front coming through, that's a really important thing for fires escaping. It's beautiful weather, everything's in condition, in, in prescription for your fire. But if there's a front coming through, lots of times that extra wind and uh, the stirring up the air currents will send little embers that are scattered out there in, in cow patties or whatever and restart a fire somewhere else. So um, that's really important to look into is not just the day that you're burning, but the next two or three days. Precipitation, one of the things we saw last year was the, the um, Kansas Forest Service came out and said, please do not burn this year. We're seeing extreme fire behavior, um, which means that fire's getting away very quickly. Things that you would normally contain were not being contained. They were jumping the fire lines. And my own, my own it was a very dry last spring. And my own uh, take on this is that generally when you burn in the spring, the soil surface is damp. Okay? But last, last spring it was not. So you didn't have that moisture from the soil helping to keep the fire under control. And that was one reason it was spreading so fast, besides the fact that the fuel was tinder dry. 
The cloud season ceiling and low cloud ceiling will slow down the fire. It will make it more patchy. Um, all these things go work together and have a ch uh, difference on the fire effects. Uh, there's also a human dimensions part of fire ecology, and this is part that's not usually talked about a lot, um, but it affects how much fire gets on the ground and how much fire there is. So the WUI is called, that is the Wildland Urban Interface, and we see that all around Manhattan, and that's when people build houses out on prairie land, okay, and it's, it's close to town, and the houses are closer than ranches would be. And lots of times they don't want to burn after they build that new house out there, right? And a lot of times they build it up on top of the hill. What did I just tell you about what fire does going uphill? It speeds up. So they're putting their, their house right where it's most likely to burn. Okay, then they don't want to burn around the house, so what happens? It builds up. It builds up. But what, what kind of vegetation do you have when you don't burn? Fruits and leaves. Woody species, especially red cedar, right, which is heavily flammable. So now you've built your house right where it's most likely to catch the fire at the hottest, and now you're going to surround it with the most flammable fuel. Okay, so this is why the wildland urban interface is a critical um, part of what's happening in, this, in the human dimensions. It's beautiful out on the prairie. Everyone wants to live out there, but you got to remember that you're, you're moving right into a fire ecosystem. And this is where, in the West, there's all the controversy. How much should a, the, the United States spend on fire protection for a house that someone built deliberately right where it's, it's most likely to burn? And ranches tend to be right more prepared for a fire than these, these uh, wildland interface houses. So just think about that when you're driving around Manhattan and you look at these houses and you see the cedars coming up and you think about if we have a drought and then we have a spark, what's going to happen? <clears throat> okay, there are legal and, and in, um, insurance issues that, that deal with fire. There are county burn bans. The county can say either the county commissioners or the governor can put a burn ban out and say no open burning. <coughs> if that comes during burn season, then that will change how much fire happens. A lot of people in urban areas don't think that, that the only reason ranchers burn is to make money and that that's bad. Okay, um, obviously in Manhattan we probably don't have that, but one of the things the ranchers are doing is also they are burning, keeping this ecosystem prairie for which there is not enough money in the state budget for the state to do it. So we would have less grassland if the ranchers weren't burning. And it is absolutely true that they're burning for money, but they are also burning to keep the trees out and other, other things like that. Uh, urban smoke, we are putting smoke into the urban areas, causing air quality problems sometimes. That's an issue also. Um, there are April, oh, excuse me, there are April burn bans. There's a smoke management plan that, that includes burning of open, uh, pro prohibition of open burning in April. That doesn't mean trash barrels, but that means things like uh, brush piles and stuff like that, and that's to, to keep additional smoke from going in the air beyond what's going in from the, the fire. So the agriculture fires are allowed, but all of the burden's not. So you're not supposed to, if you're a uh, construction company and you've got trees that you cleared and you've got a big brush pile, burn it some other time in April. Don't make it worse than it is. <clears throat> we also have burn associations starting. These are formal associations where neighbors band together, um, share equipment, share training and knowledge. And we also have, in the Flint Hills, mostly informal which is the ranchers, so one rancher will say, well, you call his neighbors and say, I'm going to burn so-and-so tomorrow, and the farm, that neighbor says, well, you know, I'll come help you if we can burn my land at the same time. And they call their neighbors, and pretty soon you've got four or five landowners and a huge extent that's going to burn at once. And that's important from the sta a safety standpoint, because uh, a larger burn is safer than a bunch of small ones. So there's this whole human thing that's going on, too. And then we have uh, ecosystem services. Rangelands provide a, a wide array of ecosystem services for which they are rarely given credit. Um, <clears throat> but we need to emphasize these because these are the way that we make our case to the urban audience for maintaining these prairie ecosystems. 
for spending money on them, for putting up with the smoke, and all these other things. So these are the things that, the, the, that we are being provided, uh, for these rangelands are being are providing. Okay, then I have uh, just two ones. And this one, you can tell, this green hill didn't burn. So which way do you think the fire was burning that hill? First of all, is, it cover, is the ground covered with ash? So what, what, what kind of fire? Dead fire. Dead fire, okay. And this didn't burn out here, so what does that tell us about the fire? Heavily grazed up there? What? Was it heavily grazed up there? It could have been. It could have been real thin soil. You know, lots. you can see lots of rocks. It may have just not been enough fuel. The wind was blowing um, some direction that didn't carry it up that way. Um, we could also say that it uh, um, wasn't real hot fire, intense fire, or it would, have, it would have probably sparked it through there. So there's a lot that we can see, see from this picture. We can also say, how long ago was that fire? Fairly recent. Yeah, we still got smoke in the air. So yeah. it's a very recent fire. <clears throat> okay. Here's another fire. What can we tell from this picture? Why backfire? How intense was it? Uh, from a wildlife standpoint, what can you say about this fire? Now, there's, there's, some, there's some stuff here you can nest in. There's some that burned. There's a lot of standing dead still, right? It wasn't a very intense fire. Um, how big was it? Big. Oh, you can see green. Is, is this green or black back here? Okay, so either that was burned earlier and it's greened up or it wasn't burned. So we've got some, some this is not as big as some of those other fires that we saw, at least at this point. So, okay, that concludes my, my talk, but I do have an activity. So, the light one? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> the light to burn. Earth drives. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one of the things I'm trying to do is talk less and give, give more activities. So I have a set of pictures here. And I'd like you to break up into groups and go where you can't hear each other. And look at the pictures and use your own knowledge and what you heard today. And then we're going to come back and you're going to tell me what you saw in the pictures. Okay, what kind of fire ecology you saw going on? Okay, let's finish up. This is taking longer than I thought, but you guys are such a great audience. Okay, what, what did you define? What do you see in this picture? What's that telling you? Jump right in there. Come on. Let's just burn. It's got a lot of patches that didn't burn, it looks like. Right? Why, why might there be a lot of patches? Low intensity. Low. And why, why might the intensity have been low? Could have been grazed. Could have been grazed. Could have been poor soil, right? Look at all the rocks. Um, how often is this piece burned, do you think? Not very often. And you can tell that by? Trees. Trees. So see, you got a lot out of this. Anybody else got any other ideas? It's not very windy. Yeah, yeah. Right. It was a very calm fire, right? And that could be another reason it didn't That's right. That's right. Anybody got anything else? Wait, well, you're you're just just awake now. What what did you see? Well, there's either very little wind, and the wind's actually looks like it's blowing in different directions in different areas there. So. Okay, and that's called yeah. light and variable. And that is the absolute worst conditions to burn in. The only other thing is like 50 miles an hour. Because light and variable, you don't know where your fire's going. It'll start burning here, and then it'll go, oh, well, I'll go over here. And you're running around trying to keep the fire contained. It's a very difficult burning situation. You're right. This looks very much like uh, a low and variable wind. OK, what do we see in this one? This is Shawnee County. What can you tell me about this? There is not burning very often. That's correct. And it's we thought they started uh, that burn line that, that's kind of close to us with drip torches, and that it was burning 
to the lake. So would that be a head fire or a back fire? Yeah. Okay. Very good. You guys are good at this. Okay, which way is the wind blowing then? Yeah. 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 This is Chase County. What can you tell me about this? Very large extent. Two to three weeks since they burn. Probably burned every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, can you tell me, you tell me about nesting habitat? Yeah. Uh, Kill deer. <laughs> <laughs> Light plays on the rocks, right there. Just yeah. <laughs> okay. This is actually further west. You can tell by the yucca. Um, what well, can you tell me about it? if we burned this? What would happen? Not much. Not much. Why is that? So if you, if you burn this, what's going to happen to those red cedars? Nothing. That's probably right. Just little ones, maybe. Little ones, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Big ones, no. yeah, that that's a pretty hard situation to get any kind of a kill on your your woody species. Um, Where is that? You know. Um. <laughs> I think Ellsworth County. It's a lot of duck up, but it's like maybe there in front. Yeah. So, um, how often is this burned? Probably not. Probably hadn't been burned in 20 years. I can't tell that, but just from the size of the trees, that's what I would guess. Trees grow at the, the red cedars grow at a, at a, a rate. Um, in, in the Flint Hills, it's considered 30 years from open grass planted to closed canopy. As you go west, that becomes uh, longer. Oops, where I did that one. Okay, this is in Oklahoma. What can you tell me about this burn? This is, a, this is a summer burn. This is in July. What else can you tell about this fire? You get a lot of smoke because of all that green. <laughs> Absolutely. How much roaring flames do you see here? No. So what is that going to tell you about it? Uh, it's a low intensity fire, but what did I tell you about air temperatures in the summer? They're high. Not that high. They are. And so how much how much intensity do you have to have to get those that fuel raised in that woody species to kill it? Not very much, because this was a hot day. This was probably a 100 degree day. So we only had to raise the temperature on those woody species 40 degrees to get them to killing temperature. And this is actually why th this is done in the summer. Is there's, there, um, in, in Kansas, they haven't seen this. The summer burn does this. In Oklahoma, they are seeing that these summer burns are giving good weight and plant control. Oh, what, what was the temperature you needed to, to break them? 140 degrees. And it's for so many seconds, I can't tell you. So anything that you can make, um, the fire goes through more slowly, so it stays at that temperature longer, you're going to get a better kill. So if you wanted the fire to move slowly, would you want a head fire moving with the wind, or would you want a back fire moving against the wind? Back, 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 back. Yeah. So if anyone says it can't burn in June or July, the answer is, oh yes, it can. Very, very definitely. These are very safe fires because they don't move very fast. In fact, they're called mom and pop fires. <laughs> a couple people can uh, burn a lot by themselves. It just doesn't, the fire just doesn't go anywhere. It's very slow. Okay, this is Douglas County. What can you tell me about this? What do you think might be happening species composition wise? Pulses and grasses are pulled over. So why might um does anybody see anything else here? Well, I see a stream without much erosion. So there's enough grass to keep the soil from moving. Um, doesn't have cattle on it. It absolutely does not have cattle on it. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes. No, there is no diversity. It's very uniform. But it doesn't quite, it's not quite look like a pasture to me. I mean, a tame, tame grass pasture, but it does look very uniform. So what would happen if you burned this? Diversity. You get diversity. 
High intensity because of why? So we probably take out the cedars. What about the hedge? Yeah. And just a re sprouters. You can kill them by the ground and they'll come back from the roots. As are most shrub species. Actually, red cedar is about the only one that doesn't, doesn't do that. So it would take, take either chemical or many years of burning to get rid of them once they got started. And I think that's it.